Hi, everybody, and welcome to Trauma Recovery University. I'm your host, Athena Moberg, and this is our other host, my amazing co-host, Bobby Parrish. Hi, Bobby. Hi, everybody. <laughs> We're so happy you're here. Thank you for spending time with your week in your week with us. Yeah, we really want to send a very special thank you to um, all of you who have been um, following along with us for so many months. And you've really just become part of the fabric of our week, every single week. And we're just really grateful for you. We have a lot of public service announcements today. Um, and we're going to go ahead and try to go through all of those public service announcements right now. So um, I'm going to start, and then I'm going to hand it over to Bobby. And I want to, first of all, welcome everyone. If you are a brand new Trauma Recovery University subscriber or viewer or listener, we really want to give you a very sincere thank you for spending time with us, as Bobby was saying. And this is a video broadcast. So if you're listening on a podcast platform, such as iTunes or Stitcher or SoundCloud or iHeartRadio or um, one of the other podcasting platforms, we want to invite you to go to our Roku TV channel. Um, if you have a Roku device, you just go to search and type in Trauma Recovery University. If you're on YouTube, you can type in Trauma Recovery University. And we also have a bit.ly link, and that's bit.ly Trauma Recovery U. And it is case sensitive, and that's a capital T, capital R, capital U. So um, we are so grateful. We often do talk with our hands, and so we invite you, if you are listening, to um, go on to our YouTube channel or our Roku TV channel and view our episodes as well. And just as a thank you for being one of our loyal viewers or listeners or subscribers or just awesome survivors, we want to give you complimentary access to our entire library of downloadable resources. Now that can be found at nomoreshameproject.com or traumarecoveryuniversity.com. Both websites have a uh, they point to the same website and there's a button that says downloadables. If you click on the button that says downloadables, you'll be given immediate access to our entire library of one-page downloadable resources. And our one-pages have become quite the thing, actually. From the very beginning of Trauma Recovery University and No More Shame Project, we have uh, Bobby uh, composes these amazing one-page resources that capture the entire topic with notes and takeaways and things that will help you feel better right away today. Not, you need to go to counseling for 20 years, you need to read five books, you need to whatever, whatever. This is just something that you simply download it, print it out, or view it on the internet, and you can follow the steps in there, take some of the, some of the tips and tricks or the, or the strategies that we offer, and apply those to your daily life and you will be able to um, be navigating your way through your trauma recovery in, in a way that is therapeutic and cathartic to you and that will happen right away. It's not doesn't need to happen over 30 years. So um, I know that we have several other public service announcements regarding our two events in June, first weekend in June, last weekend in June, as well as our anthology uh, coming out for 2015, and I know there's some other things as well. We have a change of venue for one of them. We have some exciting things, but I would like to turn it over to Bobby and allow Bobby to share the rest of our public service announcements with you. Take it away, Bobby. Hi, everybody. We are so excited about our conferences that are going to take place in June. And what we're doing is we're establishing annual conferences. So these are going to be every June. The first weekend in June. Are we going to stick with Atlanta, Athena, do you think? I believe we are going to stick with Atlanta as far as I know. There is the slightest chance that we would be doing Texas instead of Atlanta. But um, if that does change, we'll let you know. But we are pretty sure that the first weekend in June will be in Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. Um, and the idea is to you know, get more, offer the opportunity more to the East Coast. Um, region. And then um, on the West Coast, we're going to stick to the Pacific Northwest. Originally this year, we had planned to hold the conference at a retreat center in Raymond, Washington. But um, Athena and I had some long discussions over the weekend. And instead, this year, we're going to target Portland, Oregon. Um, 
just because for this year uh, it's going to be more manageable for us and it's also going to be much more accessible to people. Portland has the most amazing public transportation system. You can fly into Portland, we're going to hold it downtown Portland, fly in, take light rail to downtown, you don't have to rent a car, stay at the hotel, and zip around downtown Portland, very safe, very walkable, amazing things to see in downtown Portland when we're not in conference sessions. So we're really excited, um, and Portland is my hometown, and so we're really excited to be bringing that conference to Portland this June, the last weekend in June. So I believe it would be like the 25th, 26th, 27th, um, right in there. Yeah. yeah, and then we will be in Atlanta um, this first weekend in June uh, with Your High Potential, and um, Athena is going to be taking the lead on that one, and I am so excited. She's already got some amazing speakers lined up, and this is going to be just um, awesome stuff. So look forward to those. We will get you more information on our website and in our newsletter, so if you haven't subscribed, um, pop on over to Trauma Recovery University and get your name on the email list so we can get details out to you as soon as we have them. Also, our second annual anthology will be published this November. We have a publisher, Book Trope, and they are going to be putting out that anthology in both an ebook form and a paperback in November to coincide with No More Shame November. So we want your submissions. Um, the information is on the website, Trauma Recovery University, under the book tab. Is that right, Athena? I think it is under the book tab. Uh, and it's also under the No More Shame November tab. So okay. um, you can also shoot either one of us uh, a message on the website. We have plenty of contact tabs. And if you have trouble locating anything, we'd be happy to help you. But I do believe it just if you're navigating on the website there and you click around, you'll definitely see the, the, the tab for the anthology. I, I just can't think of it right now exactly what tab it is. That's okay. It wasn't a <laughs> test. Um. <laughs> The anthology this last year was so amazing. Um, it's called Discovering True. You can look it up on Amazon. Just incredible stories of all five-star reviews, incredible stories from survivors about their experience as a trauma survivor, a childhood abuse survivor. And this year our theme is Discovering Together. So we're sharing stories about how being in connection and community with other survivors, or maybe just one other survivor, how that helped your healing process how that helped you recover. So please start sending us your essays and your poetry. Um, this is all nonfiction. This isn't fiction. You do need to be a survivor of sexual assault in order to make a submission. And if you go onto the website, you'll look at the criteria and the timelines and you need to send us uh, attached as a word file your submission. You can Give us as many submissions as you want. We had multiple people who had several submissions selected for the anthology um, this last year. So we want everything you've got to give us. Um, submit those pieces. And then you need to cut and paste some agreements um, such as, you know, you agree to the editing process, you understand the timeline, um, that you are a survivor of sexual assault, um, you need to cut and paste that into the body of the email and then attach your submission and send it off to the No More Shame Project at gmail.com email. And um, we are just, we're so thrilled. We self published last year um, and we got two publishers who said, wait, 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 this is so awesome. We want to be a part of this. And so we picked a book trope and they are going to be, they've made a commitment to be our publisher. Um, for the indefinite future. So we're thrilled and we can't wait to start receiving your submissions. So um, get them in to us and if you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to contact either one of us either at our personal emails, um, Athena at athenamoberg.com, Bobby L. Parrish at gmail.com, um, or on the website and we'll get you uh, any kind of information or clarification that you need. Yeah. So, and we you. would love it if you guys would try to get us your submissions if possible. 
by June 30th. Um, we're going to do we're going to make the selection process uh, during the month of July, and then we're going to make the announcements of who is accepted August 1st. And we're going to start our editing process, and then it's going to go to publish, and it will be published, I believe it's November 17th this year. I'm not 100% sure, but it's in the middle of November right. that it will, it will go live on Amazon, and the paper book copies will be out as well in actual bookstores, which is very, very, very exciting. Many thanks to Booktrope. Um, we could not be uh, more grateful than we are that you've decided to... Um, pick up 2014's anthology as well as all the others. So, um, thank you to Book Trope. Little shout out, little plug there, Bobby. <laughs> um, I have. Um, I wanted to pull up. If you guys are wanting to interact with us, we we see we have a lot of uh, some live viewers that are watching right now. And you know, interestingly, the little the little counter it only shows us certain ones. Like if you're watching on Google Plus, but if you're watching. On YouTube, which is where most people find us, or if you're watching on Roku, we can't tell if you're watching. So, for those of you who are watching live, we want to welcome you to interact with us by using the hashtag No More Shame. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, log on to Twitter and be monitoring our tweets right now. If you have any questions for us, otherwise, we're going to dive right into some material. Uh, we did have our uh, chat this morning for child sexual abuse survivors. And that's hashtag CSAQT, standing for Child Sexual Abuse uh, Question Time. And it's geared more towards our UK audience. Shout out to the UK, by the way. It is 2 in the morning where you live. And we always, always appreciate when um, you have either stayed awake just to interact with us or that we are able to comfort you and be there for you and let you know that you're not alone if you are struggling with insomnia right now. So a um, very, very, very special thank you to the UK watchers. And um, I also, I know that um, I was going to wait until the very end, you guys, but I just wanted to tell you something right now, okay? Um, I'm in our, our Twitter right now. Let me just see if I have any messages from any of you guys to answer any of your questions. Oh, Wait, oh no, that was Jack. I think that was not from today. Hey, the best Stacy ever is tweeting out right now, and she is watching live. Stacy, we want to tell you we love you. Thank you so much for for tweeting us and telling everybody to get their submissions in. You're just amazing. We love you. Um, thank you. And um, for anybody else who's watching live, or if you're watching a rebroadcast, um, for all of our Roku viewers, I want to thank you for rating our channel. I think we're like four and a half stars out of five, and we have. I, I want to say it's like 15 or 17 reviews so far, and we're brand new. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, um, I'm going to try not to cry right now. <laughs> I do not want to ugly cry on live TV, even though it's Internet TV. Um, as most of you guys know, um, you've been following us for quite some time. Um, Bobby and I have been um, broadcasting these live broadcasts every single week since July of last year. And um, you've sort of come to know me and my family in just some certain uh, private situations that are very public. My life is very public. And most of you know that for a month I was in California and I was sitting by my dad's bedside uh, for 16 days, all day, every day, from morning until night. Um, he was on life support. And um, he did end up passing away very, very, very late on Valentine's night. Um, I wasn't sure if it was um, at 11-something Valentine's night or if it had just passed the midnight marker onto the 15th. But I do believe it was still um, February 14th, which is Valentine's Day. So he did pass away. And the message that I just wanted to give you guys is um, your tweets, and your text messages, and your emails, and your Facebook messages, and your correspondence, and your smiley faces, and your virtual hugs, and your thoughts, and your prayers, and just um, just you it really um, kept me going. It really strengthened me while I was going through um, a very difficult time, probably one of the most difficult things I've ever gone through in my life. I've never lost a parent. My mom is is still with us. My dad passed away and it was um, the first time I had ever experienced the full weight of every ounce of responsibility being on me and um, without any siblings to share that with. But um, 
my dad had a lot of family members that were I was in daily contact with getting messages and it was a lot of pressure um, my cousin Stephanie and her husband Ken were so incredibly wonderful and they served as a buffer between me and the rest of my family that had all these demands and questions and opinions and my daughter-in-law sat with me in the hospital and I had a couple of friends Chuck and Lynn that came and sat with me at the hospital as well and my cousin Stephanie came uh, to be there with me so um, anyway you guys my virtual family kept me going and really um, encouraged me and supported me and I felt every single bit of it so whether it was a tweet or a virtual hug or an email or a text or whatever it was I just want to thank you for being there for me during one of the hardest times in my whole life so thank you and um, I really could not have uh, kept all of this going without Bobby um, Bobby was my rock <laughs> she she took all the emails and the brunt of everything that needed to happen technologically and I just she made it to where all I had to do was show up every week so thank you Bobby I love you I love you too <laughs> sweetie you're so welcome I know that was gut-wrenchingly hard it was it was a lot but you know what you made it um, bearable and all, each of you guys each of you guys right here you're the ones who made it bearable for me Thank you so much. <laughs> and um, I mean, it goes without saying that my husband is the most wonderful man alive ever. And that's why his name in my phone is my wonderful husband. Um, true story. And um, so, yeah. Yes. I listen sometimes to Athena talk to her phone, call my wonderful husband. And her phone does. <laughs> <laughs> Siri says to me, calling my wonderful husband, iPhone. <laughs> so. Um, but each of you are just so near and dear to my heart and um, I know all of you by name and um, whether it's Pepper or Jack or Simi or Brenda or or baby girl or whoever you are on Twitter I know each and every one of you and I appreciate each and every one of you you guys are like the closest thing to family and if it wasn't for you guys holding me up and just encouraging me um, I probably would have crumbled so I know that was a really lengthy public service announcement but um, I feel like you guys are really worth it so thanks for well, listening and we have an amazing topic today um, we are talking about healthy romantic relationships as they pertain to adult survivors of child sexual abuse and um, I just have to say that this was probably one of my favorite uh, Twitter chats that we did this morning Bobby I thought that there were so many helpful um, suggestions and interesting questions and um, uh, very um, um, the the perspectives the the perspectives were so drastically different than what I thought they would be there were yes. so many people on one end and so many people on the other end and and there's that scary middle that we always talk about and right. um, there, were, there were just the, the, the thought-provoking questions that were going on this morning during our UK chat were just it was awesome it was off the hook I loved it, it was, so much it was it was an amazing chat I think we put out about 600 tweets um, in the course of an hour which means um, what is that a tweet a second I think that is a tweet a second yeah <laughs> my, my, math, my bad math skills are, are, are failing me here um, but it was it was a very lively discussion and it, it covered a, a broad range of subjects which you know when you're talking about re relationships that covers a broad range of subjects and issues so um, it was very interesting it was very very interesting if you want to go back and look at the chat transcript it's on Storify um, under my name uh, Bobby Parrish or it's under my Twitter name truth is hers uh, and you can go back and reread it but and then we have another Twitter chat tomorrow night at 6 p.m. PSAT whoops 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time I don't know where I got the A in there um, under the hashtag <laughs> sex abuse chat and it's the same um, theme we do the same topic for our Monday chat our Monday night Google Hangout and our Tuesday night chat and it always comes out different everybody it, it's it changes according to who attends so awesome stuff yeah 
Okay. Thank you so much, you guys. We have like the, we have the most incredible one sheet today. The one page that we have. Um, if you are just tuning in, thank you for tuning in to Trauma Recovery University. And you can go to traumarecoveryuniversity.com and click on downloadables. You will get instant access to our entire library of downloadable one-page resources, just as a complimentary free gift because you're amazing and you're listening or watching or uh, or you've subscribed. So, um, Bobby composes these incredible one-page resources every single week and then I get to format them and make them as beautiful as I would like to make them and uh, we know that you guys have told us how incredibly helpful they are for you so without further ado I think we're gonna we're gonna dive right into some content um, I know that that was about 20 minutes of uh, public service announcements and introductions and discussion um, but you know we're just so grateful for you guys and we're grateful that you show up every week so um, if we can do anything, uh, we can add topics or uh, do anything format related um, here on the broadcast or during our Twitter chats or anything, please don't hesitate to make a suggestion. We do everything the way you guys want us to do it. You chose the colors for our website. You tell us how you want things. We make sure it's done. We're here for you guys. You're the reason we're here. So, um, Bobby is our amazing screen share person. She is the she is the person who does all the techie stuff in the background. Um, when I sit here and talk, she's doing <laughs> mad skills behind the scenes. <laughs> Which is so amazing because um, in, in so many other ways, Athena has all the tech skills. She does the website stuff. But um, the concept of healthy relationships, romantic relationships, is um, a bit of a minefield for survivors because we did not get a lot of information about healthy relationships when we were children and especially if our abuser was in our family, in our immediate family um, or our immediate family was dysfunctional. Um, sometimes for people who are abused as children there is a lot of anger, sometimes there's domestic violence, um, oftentimes there's emotional and verbal abuse going on in the family. And then we don't have good role models either so there isn't really a way for us to learn how to have healthy relationships um, in our childhood and we grow up with perceptions and beliefs about relationships that are usually pretty unhealthy uh, this morning a lot of people talked about how when they were growing up um, they thought that chaos um, and emotional and verbal abuse and you know just people treating each other badly was the norm and so when they grew up and they chose partners and they were in romantic relationships with people and those people acted that way and there was chaos and there was distress and there was abuse sometimes we didn't object or we were comfortable with it um, because it's what we grew up with. Now, comfortable doesn't mean you like it. It just means that you're comfortable with it. It's the beast you know. And when you know the beast, then you kind of feel like maybe you can try and control it. And sometimes that beast you know is a lot less scary than something you don't know. And so the possibility of creating a relationship um, with boundaries and conflict resolution and all those things is so scary that we don't want to jump over into that pond and we understand that we get it a lot of people talked about that this morning um, and so we're kind of left hanging when we you know reach an age where we're starting to develop romantic relationships and we haven't gotten the role models we haven't gotten the skills so what we to talk to you about are some of the skills that you can develop now that will help you to have healthy run romantic relationships and um, I'm so excited that you have a balance today between Athena and I in terms of um, where we are. Um, I've been married twice. Uh, neither of my marriages was that healthy and I've been divorced now from my second marriage for almost eight years and um, I realized that I was not very good at picking partners and I wasn't going to tackle that again 
until I dealt with the reasons that caused me to choose bad partners. And so I'm single. I've been single for eight years. Um, not out there looking because I know what I need to do. I know I need to do my work. But Athena, um, she, um, she had a couple of failed relationships. She realized she needed to make changes. She made them and she is now in a healthy marriage. And so I'm so excited that you get because um, this is kind of what we had this morning. We had people who were saying, you know what, um, not into romantic relationships, not going to pursue one, um, never had a good one, um, you know, don't even really know where to start. I'm working on that. And then we had a, a, a group of people who said, you know what, I found my good person. And it has been such a, support, a source of support and help for me. And um, they were able to talk and communicate with each other and give each other ideas and advice and hope and understanding and support. Uh, and it was an amazing thing. So tonight you're kind of getting the same thing. You know, you've got me who's still really learning in that aspect of my life. And Athena, um, who I know is not here to tell you that she's got it all right, um, but she's here to tell you that she's learned and she's really making some good choices in this marriage. She's um, she's chosen a wonderful man and um, she's really practicing good uh, communication and relationship skills with him and so you can draw from both of our experiences up as, as we talk tonight. So there you go Athena, I put you on the hot seat. I know, thank you though for the compliment. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's kind of um, a different place for me to be in being the person who is like I don't know, in that place where I've actually, I don't feel like I'm at the bottom of the learning curve for once, which is interesting. Yes, so, yes, um, yes, and you are not. I, I, I wouldn't, I definitely, one thing Bobby did say that is absolutely correct, I would not say that I have anything completely figured out at all, seriously. I do, however, walk my talk. I practice what I preach, as hard and difficult and horrifying and terrifying and um, uncomfortable as it may be sometimes, when I tell you guys to have healthy boundaries in relationships and I'm teaching a class on using phrases like, when you do this, I feel this way and I need you to do this instead. Those are uncomfortable conversations to have with someone because well, for a million different reasons. The other person could say, well, that's not what I was doing at all, and that's not what I meant. You're just too sensitive. You, you heard it that way, but that's not what I meant. And you could, you could open up a box that you're not wanting to open up because it's terrifying to, to assert and maintain healthy boundaries with people because you're delving into a relationship, and it's unpredictable. You can't control it and predict it and put it in a neat little box with a bow on it because that's not what relationships are. Relationships are messy and life is messy. And um, Bobby mentioning romantic relationships and um, my failed relationships and that I learned and I've done the hard work. Um, I married my high school sweetheart. I met him when I was 14 years old. Uh, we got engaged on his 18th birthday. I was 17. We got married when we were both we both turned 18, and we had our son right away, who is an amazing blessing. He's currently deployed in the military, um, but I was a single mom by the time I was 19, 20 years old. I mean, we were both very, very young. He had his entire life ahead of him and wanted to pursue other things, a career and you know travel, whatever it was, and I was just like, well. I'm going to be the best dang mom I could possibly be. This is my deal. This is what I'm going to do. And at the same time, I felt like I wanted to find a dad for my, uh, for my son. And so rather than having healthy boundaries and going out and dating someone that I thought was healthy and good for me, I was just scoping out who I thought might be a good dad for my son. Like who is big and strong and could teach him how to ride a bike and like 
you know, teach them about the birds and the bees and everything in between and all of that. And um, I, who had, and my, one of my big litmus tests was someone who had healthy parents, parents that had been married for a really long time, not divorced parents. Um, I had all these little things, that this little checklist in my head. Well, you know, my son was about seven, seven or eight years old, and I got remarried. And I, I went down my list. He was big and strong and this and that and funny, and he was a surfer, and he was athletic, and he had a great job and a career, and his parents had been married for 45 years. And, I mean, it was like all that list that I had made in my head, right? But... I did it for the wrong reasons. He was all the things I thought my son needed, like he needed a dad. But romantically, um, we were toxic with one another. Um, he was healthy by himself, and then when he was with me, and taking on all the responsibility of being a husband and uh, a new father, um, yes, he taught my son how to ride a bicycle. That was fantastic. However, his coping strategies for life turned very toxic. There was a lot of alcohol going on. There was drug use. There was pornography. There was all kinds of horrible things that were not on my proverbial list. I could have never foreseen the, the trauma that I was going to go through with this person. It was horrifying and we were divorced within a year. I was the big, I felt like the biggest loser in the entire world. And I've said this on previ previous broadcasts and I'm going to say it again. By the time I went to my 10 year high school reunion, I was divorced twice and bankrupt, and I felt like a complete loser. And then fast forward 10 years after that, 15 years now, I have been 100% in line, healthy boundaries, learning about myself, learning about personal development, professional development, how to have healthy boundaries, how to maintain them how to raise a child in a healthy way, how to have healthy friendships, how to be healthy financially. And it's hard. Having healthy relationships and doing things in a healthy way is hard. So hard. It is difficult. It's not easy to make excellent choices because they take follow-through and commitment. And it's never, ever, ever easy. There's no shortcut to doing things the right way. It's just such a ripoff when people tell you there is a shortcut to doing things the right way. It's just not true. So um, all the things that Bobby and I um, teach and talk on on this broadcast and during our Twitter chats, um, there are things that we're really passionate about. And we don't have everything figured out, but we walk our talk. When Bobby composes a one page and talks about the different steps and, and tips and strategies to achieve a healthy blank, fill in the blank. She's walking her talk. She's as hard as it may be, she's doing everything that she possibly can to live out the things that she's teaching. And that's one way that she and I, we just instantly click. There's that congruence, which I think we're going to be talking about next week. Yeah. Yep. Next oh, week's yeah. congruence. I love it. It's like one of my favorite topics in the whole world. I love it. So, um, you're going to learn a lot next week on congruence and why it's so important for adult survivors of child abuse to live with an integrity um, in and of themselves and why it's so important to be surrounded by people that live in integrity with themselves and why what they think, say, and do all needs to be in alignment with what they believe in and it has to be in alignment with what you believe in and otherwise there's these, these alarms, these five alarm fires going off in your head and and my girlfriends and I, um, from my survivor group that I had here on this island, we call them our spidey senses. When our spidey senses, or we call them fruit flags, like, hello, my spidey senses and my fruit flags are going crazy. Like, there's flags going up all over the place. Red flags, red flags, spidey senses are going nuts. And Bobby and I talk about our spidey senses, too. Like, seriously, if someone comes across as being a safe person, and then they show their true colors, and they're very disingenuous or not in congruence with like what they what they projected themselves to be it takes a long time for a survivor to actually get past that because otherwise you're going to be in a constant state of hypervigilance waiting for the rug to be ripped out from underneath you when you're in community or in relationship with that person whether it's professionally or personally so um, 
we have a really, really cool one page today that talks about the issues. We tag them issues because everybody's got issues. What A funny joke that we used to say in my family is everybody's got issues. Some families have full subscriptions. I have a full subscription. <laughs> That's an issue. So these issues. I like that. <laughs> These issues that we talk about in today's one page um, are very common across the board to a lot of abuse survivors. Some of them might resonate with you and, and ping you a little deeper than others, but we're not just going to leave it at that. We're not just going to be like, "These are your issues. We'll see you next week." No, we're gonna we're gonna give you some tips and strategies, and we're gonna we're gonna point you in the right direction and the best course of action to take today. So that you can feel better today and feel like you've made just a little step in the right direction for your own recovery today. So um, I'm super excited about our one page. And Bobby, thank you for all your hard work and always just, I know we both like study all these different things. We read all these different articles. We're always emailing back and forth. I found this article. I found this. Isn't this awesome? Look at this YouTube video. I mean, all week long, all the time. But um, Bobby hones it all in and writes the copy, and then I get to make everything beautiful and aesthetically pleasing. So. And you do. <laughs> and I do. <laughs> so let's take a look at this. Um, and I'm going to make sure I push all the right buttons here. Present to everyone. And then I'm going to go back over here and do... Yes! Is Yay. that right, Athena? Yay! Oh, it's awesome. It looks beautiful. Okay. And big. Um, and big, yes, absolutely. So we've kind of already covered the top portion in terms of how we, growing up, don't have good relationship role models. Um, we may have grown up with ones that are grossly dysfunctional and that are damaging to us. Um, and then when we reach an age, we don't have the skills. We start to choose relationship partners. And we end up choosing bad ones and we end up having difficult romantic relationships that traumatize us even further and hinder our recovery and some of them even lead to us being re-victimized a large large number of survivors of childhood abuse are re-victimized as adults because of um, the issues they have from their childhood that they have not been able to resolve and not through fault of their own um, but they haven't gotten the help that they need and so um, they end up in, a, in abusive relationships and domestic violence relationships they end up in date rape situations and it is horrible because it re-traumatizes them and it means that is something more now that they have to recover from so we want to try and talk to you and there's there's a lot here there's a lot on this one page and so we're gonna go through things with a little bit of speed and point you in some other directions and give you a little more information on how to tackle some of these issues um, and the first thing is that and this is so important to me because we have to become aware of our self-esteem and shame issues so we don't settle for an unhealthy partner because we think that's all we deserve um, when when we are in an abusive situation that abuse lies to us and it tells us that the shame of what's happening belongs to us rather than our abuser and it tells us that we are not worth anything we are worth how we're being treated which is badly and so when we grow up feeling ashamed and feeling a low sense of self-worth we don't think we deserve to be loved we certainly don't think we deserve to be treated well so when come someone comes along and indicates an interest in us we're like hey wow that's really cool this person says they love me and we accept it and we embrace that without even looking to check and see whether this person's a healthy person. We're just so excited that someone is showing us attention and affection that we jump on that first train that comes along or we jump on every train that comes along because 
um, the first one that we jump on, it ends up being so horrible, we get back off, and then the next one comes, we try that one, and we try, and we try, and we try, and we end up being in serial relationships because we haven't learned how to pick a good partner because we don't think we're worth it. So we really need to become aware of how our self-worth and our shame issues impact our choices. Um, the next thing we need to do is learn healthy boundaries. We have done a hangout about this. So go back onto the YouTube channel, go onto the Roku channel, go onto our website, and find the one page about learning healthy boundaries. Healthy boundaries are so important from the get-go with any relationship. Survivors usually go to one of two extremes. And we talked this morning about chat about extremes. Um, and Lene Butler, who's a marriage and family therapist and participates in our chats, said something this morning that really hit home for me. And survivors, we were talking about how survivors um, exist in extremes. And specifically, this we started on this topic, and down a little further on the one page, you'll talk. We'll talk about sexual intimacy and open sexual communi communication about our sexual needs and triggers with our partner. And someone said, "Why is it that survivors seem to be either, um, especially young survivors, tend to be very promiscuous or?" completely uninterested in a sexual relationship. Why the two extremes? And Lene said, trauma is an extreme experience. And it sets us up to live in extremes, to cope in extreme ways. And it sets us up for a very black and white thinking. And so Often in terms of boundaries, survivors can go from one end to the other. Either they have very rigid boundaries and they don't let anybody in, they don't talk about anything personal, they put up a front, they try to be the person that they think the other person wants them to be, or they go the other way and on the very first date we're telling everyone our whole life story down to the nitty gritty details when that's not either, either necessary or appropriate, um, especially on our first date. So healthy boundaries, um, essential in any kind of a relationship, but especially when you're talking about building um, a romantic partnership. And then we need to be able to have clear and open communication. This can be a hard one for survivors because um, we typically don't, did not have the privilege of being able to openly communicate when we were children, um, when we tried to openly communicate and say things like, that hurts, I, I don't want you to do that, I don't want to go to that house, I don't want to be with that person, we're typically either verbally or physically smacked down or shamed or shut down. And so we didn't learn how to have open and clear communication. We didn't learn how to voice our needs and wants. Um, and we have to learn that. Um, we have to be able to have clear and open communication with our partner in order to have a healthy relationship. Um, and that leads us right into the next one, which is developing confidence in expressing our needs and wants to our partner. This is a really hard one for me. And I, I have to work on this one in every kind of relationship that I have. Because when I was a child, if I voiced my need and my want, I was punished for it. Um, having needs and wants as a child got me labeled as a selfish and bad person. And then I entered into some relationships as an adult where I was told the same thing. Um, in my second marriage, when I would say, um, I don't feel good about this happening, I need for it to be different, um, my husband's response would be, well, in my first marriage, that was always okay. And so the problem must be with you and not with me. And so I felt so ashamed for having voiced a need and a want that I stopped doing it because every time I got slapped down. Um, and so this, is, this can be 
an issue for a lot of survivors. And Athena does the most amazing um, three-step process. And she talked about it earlier of the, um, when you do A, I feel B, I need you to C. And I know she does that, um, that she lets people know what she's feeling and what she needs and what she wants. Um, and we need to learn how to do that. And again, these are all these are not one and done things. If you're in a relationship right now and you're going, wait, I don't do that. Oh, I don't do that. Wait, I don't do that. We understand. It's a process, a process of learning these things. And so don't feel ashamed. Don't beat yourself up if you don't have all these 100% down. We're all learning. And you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have them all down 100%. You just have to realize where your greatest needs are, where your greatest points of growth are, and take small steps forward on yeah. each of those. We want to be very clear in letting you guys know that. Um, I love this one page because it is so comprehensive. And yeah. there's, there's two sides to the very comprehensive one pages. And one is we, Bobby and myself, love to teach. We live to teach these tactics and these strategies and, and educate you on this. It's, it's very powerful and we love it. On the other hand, there's always a little naggling that we have in our mind, like, gosh, are we going to overwhelm them? Are they going to feel completely bombarded, like they don't know how, to, they're just completely immobilized because there's so much on the list? And we're here to tell you that that's okay. You're not alone. If you're looking at this comprehensive list of issues that tend to be applicable if you're an adult survivor of child abuse, specifically sexual abuse, you're not alone alone. Learning to communicate one need, even if it's just a need for your husband or your wife to not leave the cap off of the toothpaste. Start small. Uh, you know, my husband has communicated needs to me. If you can just have a small win, um, just one little thing a day that you can celebrate, oh my goodness, that is just huge. This, this part about discussing your needs and communicating your needs, is so incredibly terrifying because our needs, like Bobby was saying, were not met. We're so afraid of rejection, we're so afraid that we're going to get labeled, etc., etc., that even just that one line on the one page, just that one sentence that, uh, like I think it's the fourth bullet point down, yep. developing confidence and expressing our needs. We could do an hour or a two-part, two-hour talk just on expressing our needs. So please, this list is very, very comprehensive. If it's overwhelming, please practice excellent self-care as you always do whenever you watch any of these broadcasts and just know that you're not alone. And seriously, tweet us about it, email us about it, ask us questions. Um, we don't want to overwhelm you, we just want to equip you so that you, you know the tools that are in your toolbox. And know that... Um you know, like I said, Athena's in a healthy marriage now, but I know she is not going to be here to tell you she's got it all down. She's working on the, these things. I am most definitely working on these things, so we are right there with you. Um, we are imperfect. We will never be perfect. Um, we kind of like being imperfect now that we've learned how to embrace that. Um, and we'll help you in any way that we can. So... Um, no, yes, we recognize this can be overwhelming. Pick one or two to, to start taking some small steps on. Um, and then the next one, the ability to have open discussions about our sexual relationship, especially triggers. This is a hard one. This is really, really hard. And in yeah. fact, for some survivors, they haven't even yet come to understand what their sexual triggers are. So... Um, just learning what those are, being at a point in your recovery where you even let yourself acknowledge that you have them and work on them is huge. And in chat this morning, I was surprised by the people who were so open. Uh, they were so open this morning about this one, despite how, what a difficult topic this is to talk about. And people saying, you know, I just... 
Um, I don't want to be in a sexual relationship. I never ever want to be in one. To you know, I want to be in one, but I have no idea even how to start. Um, and we talked about the difference between um, being involved in just a physical sexual relationship and actually having an intimate component to our sexual relationship with our partner. Um, they, people in chat this morning were just amazing about this. They were, and I do want to. I want to uh, point out specifically one of our. Um, one of our tweets during our chat this morning, Bobby, and this is for any of you out there that are married. Um, please, please, please know that if you're having an issue being in a sexual relationship with your spouse, you're not alone. There was a gal today, and I'm assuming it was a woman, um, she was speaking from a female perspective, and she said, I've been married for quite some time, and my husband and I have never had sex. He is very understanding, and we are working towards that. Um, now, I know that that's an extreme, and it seems preposterous to some people, um, and it's, you know, they're, they're like, oh, I would just feel like, I feel like, you know, such a freak or whatever. Right. But, you know, we're here to tell you that, you know, you didn't ask to be sexually abused as a child and have, all of these triggers as an adult and the, the years and years and years of recovery, you didn't ask for this. This is not your fault. The shame in any of this is not yours to carry, which is why we often refer to our hashtag no more shame, which by the way, we have people interacting with us right now using that hashtag no more shame. So don't be shy. Send us any tweets you want. Um, just use the hashtag no more shame. Even if you don't know our our um, handles by heart or whatever you can you can just send out a tweet using the hashtag no more shame and we will um, we'll see your tweets and we'll respond to them so um, but please even if you are married and you you feel like there's a lot of pressure to perform sexually your mental and emotional health is more important than any sexual relationship with your spouse and your spouse didn't marry you just for sex I'm willing to bet that I'm willing to bet that they care about you as a person, as a whole, your mind, your body, your spirit, your everything. Um, I'm willing to bet that your spouse, if you got the courage to hopefully share with them um, some of your triggers or share about your abuse, they would probably, if not right away, at some point, hopefully be able to receive that and want to do what was best for you um, so that you would feel safe. So you're not alone. No, you're not alone, and I know that um, I'm so um, overwhelmed with the courage that that woman had this morning to talk about that, um, and I promise you that she is not alone. I have heard that before from survivors, so if you're out there thinking, I must be the only person in the world who, despite the fact that I love my spouse, I don't want to have sex with them. You are not. You are not alone. Or if you're out there thinking, I love my spouse, um, I want to have sex with them, but I just, I get in the moment and all these memories come back and it's just an awful experience. You're not alone. You're so, not alone. And no. there are people, Bobby and I have spoken to people, it's more common than you think for, um, for people, whether you're male or female, to have some sort of a, a pornography addiction um, where you're acting out sexually with someone besides your sexual partner, uh, besides your spouse, because right. for some reason in your mind, sex is dirty or naughty or whatever, and there can be, um, so you have this hard time being in a sexual relationship with your spouse um, because of um, the abuse that you incurred when you were a child. So. Um, these are not these are things that are not easy to talk about, but we just want you to know that you're not alone. If you if that's you and or you're not able to be in a sexual relationship with your spouse because of your abuse or any of these things, you're not alone. That's the biggest message we want you to know. Yep. And then we talk about something that <laughs> And I keep saying that, you know, these are things I can really identify with. And boy, can I identify with this next one. Tolerating and managing conflict rather than avoiding it 
or losing ourselves to rage, there are the two, again, the two, um, I want to say extremes, but those aren't necessarily extreme. So either we avoid conflict altogether, or when we get into conflict with people, we find ourselves just automatically engulfed in rage and anger. Conflict is very hard for survivors. Very, very hard because we were not allowed as children to say no or to say, you know what, that's not right. Um, I can't do that. I don't want that. Conflict is dangerous to us. And wrapped up with that is the fact that often conflict comes with anger. And for many, many survivors, anger feels very, very dangerous. Because often when there was anger in our homes as children, it was followed by abuse or it was accompanied by abuse. People were beaten. People were yelled at. People were emotionally and verbally abused. So anger becomes very, very scary. Um, so we, we want to learn. I mean, relationships, it's just they're going to have conflict. And I don't mean angry, screaming conflict. I mean you're going to disagree with some of the things that your partner says, believes, wants. And that's, that's okay. But you have to be, find a way to talk about those things in a way that both of you are comfortable with and in a way that is healthy um, without it disintegrating into an abusive situation or without you swallowing your needs and wants and just going along with what the other person wants because you're too afraid to speak up for yourself. Again, probably this is something that we should cover in a Google Hangout is um, dealing with conflict and anger because again that's something that you know we could be here forever talking about this one. Uh, um, the, the next one being our authentic self and we talked about this a tiny bit before. When we're in a relationship with someone, especially our partner, we want to be able to be who we are. Um, instead of developing a persona or a person that we think they will love or they will want to be in a relationship with. We want to be ourselves. We want to be real. We want to be true. We want to know that we're loved unconditionally, flaws and all. And so we have to be willing to put ourselves out there as our true and genuine and authentic self rather than creating a person who we think will earn their approval and love. That's a hard one. It feels very vulnerable. It feels very scary. Um, learning to trust. We talked about this in chat this morning. Um, oh, yeah. It's difficult to have a relationship, a healthy relationship, that is not built on trust. But if you are a survivor of abuse, it's difficult to trust. So learning how to trust, um, and we talked about, Athena talked about congruence earlier. Congruence and trust run together. Because in order to trust someone, we have to see that their words and their behaviors match each other. We have to say, see that what they say they believe, what they say they are going to do, matches up with what they do. And then we can have trust, or we can work on having trust. Um, the next one, and I know I'm going kind of quickly, but I know we're almost out of time. Establishing interdependence with a partner as opposed to independence, meaning like, you know, and I always picture this, I see this little diagram in my head, you know, of two circles. And um, I'm a circle and my partner's a circle. And independence is the circles don't overlap. Dependence is when the circles are completely on top of each other. So we can't, we simply, we're codependent, we can't function without the other person. We're completely dependent on them and meeting their wants and needs. What we want is interdependence. And that's when the circles kind of overlap, but they also have still um, separate separate hobbies, separate friends, separate desires, um, and we encourage our partner to pursue the things that make them happy. 
We don't demand that every moment of their waking lives be spent with us fulfilling our wants and needs. This next one is um, kind of complicated and I'm just going to kind of touch on it. Probably this again needs to be one that we have to have. Um, I really feel like a lot of these are, are each an individual episode in and, in and of itself. <laughs> they kind of are. I think yeah. we've kind of got our editorial calendar here in front of us for a few months. I think we do. I do. Um, Somebody brought this up in chat this morning, and it is attachment issues. Um, and attachment issues come from our childhood. Um, and I think we've talked about them on other episodes in terms of we are hardwired as children to attach, to bond to our caregiver. And that's an, in, an instinctive um, bond for our own personal safety and well-being. It's imprinted on our brain to do that. But when our caretaker harms us, we cannot fully attach. It's like, um, and this is the best description I've ever heard and I use it all the time, it's like when um, it putting, the, the, putting your foot on the accelerator and the brake of your car at the same time. So you see your caretaker as a child and you both want to run towards them and be loved by them, but at the same time you want to run away from them because you're scared. Because and they're harming you. That's right. And when we're not able to have a healthy attachment when we're children, that impacts our capacity to have healthy relationships for the rest of our lives. So we have to recognize that as survivors, we might have attachment issues and we might need to work on those. And those can be tricky. Um, that is almost something that I universally say, you know, you really need to do some self-discovery, some reading, um, perhaps working with a therapist or working with a coach to work out those attachment issues because they can run pretty deep. And then the last issue is we really need to talk about with our partner, especially when we're getting to the point where we're realizing this is going to be someone that we're going to marry or we're going to have as a long-term partner. They need to know um, our family dynamics for, as you know what they're like now, and we need to decide as a couple how we are going to interact with our families. Um, are we going to spend Christmas with my family when at that Christmas you know, function might be my abuser? It can be a really hard thing to ask our partner to be in the presence of someone who they know hurt us so badly. That's asking a lot of them to do yeah. that and remain quiet. So we need to talk these things out and decide how we're going to handle them ahead of time. And you know, this does, this is a, again, this is something that does take very advanced communication skills. If you and your spouse or your partner are not completely in alignment with one another, meaning that you're, you're very, very, very able to communicate with one another and be understood. Like um, I teach something called mirroring, which I'm sure you guys understand. Um, many of you will understand if you have been in any type of ther therapy or counseling or whatever. Mirroring. If you're able to do any type of mirroring with your spouse, like you're telling them, my Uncle Joe was my abuser. If we go to Christmas at my house, my Uncle Joe is there. there uh, there's a chance that I'm gonna have. They're gonna want me to be ne next to my Uncle Joe, but I need you to to protect me. I need you to uh, be the buffer. Please be my safe person. Understand that it's very difficult for me. I only want to stay one hour. Etc. 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 And then your partner, your spouse, as lame as it may sound to you, asks them, "Could you please repeat that? Agree in advance that you're going to mirror. Could you please repeat back to me what I said to you, what you understand of what I said? Well, you're saying you don't want to go to Christmas because Uncle Joe's going to be there. No, that's not what I said. I said I need you to protect me. And just if you can just discuss with your spouse or your partner." This is a big topic. I think we need to set aside some time so that we are in full 100% understanding and agreement regarding this family relationship and the role it's going to play in our relationship or, or who is the safe person, who's not a safe person. It's very, 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 very important for 
your partner, your spouse, to really hear you. Because if you're not heard, it's going to trigger you, likely, nine times out of ten. If you share with your spouse that there's a family dynamic and, and they really didn't hear you or they didn't, they don't understand the gravity of the topic, you're likely to be triggered and take it out on them. Because when you were younger and you tried to speak up for yourself, you probably may not have been heard. And so it triggers you and then all of a sudden you're taking out all that anger and frustration on your spouse. So I can't stress enough, you guys, how clear, effective communication comes into, in, into play on the very last bullet point right above where it says pro tip where you discuss the role that your family will play in the relationship or your family member um, or if your family is dysfunctional or if your abuser is, is you know, still a part of the family, if they're still alive or et cetera. It is so huge, you guys. This one little bullet point, the very last one, could literally set like dominoes falling down in motion of every single other bullet point on this list if you don't have open communication and you don't feel heard. What do you think, Bobby? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, that, that one could be my undoing <laughs> in terms to me feeling completely misunderstood and, and shamed and um, yeah. you know, shutting down completely. That's, that's my way when, I, when things like this happen to me, when things like that happen, I just shut down. And which is very frustrating for my partner, I know. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, and you know what? I mean, I'm not here to tell you that I have it all figured out. You guys, you already know that. But the last bullet point, my husband and I are still working on that one. And we've been married for four years almost. So we've literally been intentionally working on the last bullet point for the last four years. These things, like Bobby said, are not one and done. No. Or as Matt says, they're not a flash in the pan or whatever. It's not just a quick, you know, let's mark the whole discussion about this off of our list. That's right. <laughs> you know, I mean, oh, no. done. It's oh, like done. ongoing. Oh, <laughs> it's an ongoing conversation that needs to happen, especially if your abuser is still alive or if there are right. family reunions or any type of family engagements right. that you've agreed to attend together. Um, and this last one, this pro tip, in order to develop the skills necessary for a healthy relationship, we often have to learn them as an adult in therapy or coaching, by educating ourselves, or by observing couples we look up to and admire. Um, oftentimes, it's so helpful to find a role model couple um, and watch them and observe, ask them questions. Um, I can't under-stress how impactful it can be to, d to find healthy role models as adults. We didn't have them as children, we can, but we can pick them now as adults still. Yes, like we talked about this during chat, picking yes. our surrogate family. Yes. I have, I have family on the mainland that are my surrogate family and I got to spend time with them while my dad was in the hospital. So, um, and they are a family that I've known for years and years and years. Um, and they have they were a role model for me back then and they're still a role model for me now because I, I often refer to this um, when you are when you have promised yourself as a child I, I'm not going to end up like that and my family dynamics are going to be different my child's not going to go through that abuse my marriage isn't going to be like that it is like reinventing the wheel every single day yeah. All you know is that you need to do the absolute opposite and you don't have a pattern or a, or a model of like what right. it is you should be doing. Right, right. Yeah. So we can't stress to you enough how exhausting it is. Trust me, I reinvented the wheel every day for like 17 years. Seriously. It is exhausting. That's an excellent point of thing. It's exhausting. It is so exhausting and you never quite feel like you got it right because you're like, okay, I know I'm not treating my child the way I was treated. I know I'm not molesting my child. I know I'm not yelling at my child. I know I'm not beating my child or forcing him to work out in the sun with no food or water. I know that there's not like human trafficking sort of like environment going on in my family. But just because those things aren't happening doesn't mean that you have a healthy family dynamic. There are so many things that, that you do do to, to, 
to make a healthy family dynamic. Right. It's not right. all mostly about what you don't do. Because right. I can not molest my child and not hit him and not force him into manual labor and 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 do all kinds of horrible things to him. And he could still be, you know, on drugs, in jail, struggling and not feeling loved by me. And that would be heartbreaking if he didn't know that I loved him and that I did my best. Right. So finding those role models as adults, that surrogate family that we were talking about, so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel is huge. Now I have that family in California, Chuck and Lynn, who are my role models. And then when I moved here to Hawaii, it took me a while, a couple years, but I found my role model family here. They came both came from divorced uh, they, they both came from divorced parents. Both of their parents were divorced. And they agreed when they got married that they would never divorce, ever, no matter what. And they have done so many things in their relationship to build these healthy building blocks and these healthy standards in their relationship. And I mm -hmm. saw that. I saw that from afar. I saw that sitting behind them in church. I saw that at functions we would go to. I watched how, I studied how they interacted with one another. Right. And how they were sort of silly or how they would sort of like lean and like joke with each other. Like, and I, I watched them. I studied them. And I was like, you know what? I need to be intentional about this. And I approached them when I knew my son was going to be graduating high school because I had vowed that I wasn't going to date until my son got out of high school once I moved here. I just didn't want to be distracted because I felt like he deserved my full attention. But I intentionally sought them out and had a conversation with them. And, you know, I said, I'm, I'm contemplating dating again uh, when Jordan graduates high school. And I've been sort of, like, not like in a creepy way stalking you guys for several years, but I've really, I enjoy your relationship. It, it's, I admire it. And I would just love to be able to, like, sit with you and maybe have coffee or, you know, uh, have, like, have dinner with you guys or something and just pick your brain and, and ask you questions that would really mean a lot to me. And you know what they said? Wow. Okay. We we would love to. I mean, it was like kind of embarrassing. I thought, you know, they were going to think I was weird and stalking them or something. But, you know, and their names are Jim and Tamara. And, and I actually sat with them and told them everything I just said. And we've become great friends. And they know my husband. They've known my husband for 30 years. And they've only known me for nine years. So it was funny when we kind of ended up getting together. It's like, Kind of funny, but um, like those those role models as an adult and those relational role models or other parents, you see the way the relationship with certain parents, the relationship they have with their children. You're right. like, wow, their kids are so loving and respectful towards them, and they're not afraid to hug them in public or 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 you know even though they're in high school. Like, wow, how did they do that? How do they parent their child? I just got to figure this out. Wow. You know, even if your children are young, it's not too late to do that, you know? Right. Um, and, and it just, it makes all the difference in the world. It really is just a really, it's a big deal. And it can save you guys a lot, years and years of um, beating your head against the wall and sort of, like we said earlier, trying to reinvent the wheel every day, which is super exhausting. So Yeah. Um, and as survivors, we're great observers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, but that hypervigilance yeah. in there makes us wonderful observers. And so um, we need to learn to trust our observations and our intuition that someone would be a healthy role model for us. Absolutely. And you only you know that. Only you know the type of parent you want to be and the type of relationship you want to have with your children, the type of relationship you want to have in a romantic relationship with a partner. Only you know. Like, What's best for everybody over there isn't going to be best for you. You you naturally gravitate towards people. And the key here, which we will probably do a whole other episode on this, are you gravitating towards this person because they remind you of your upbringing and it's familiar and it's unhealthy and you're like, Ooh, right? what's this? Why am I this drawn to that? This is the beast I that? know. Yes. You, gotta let, you have to know yourself and you have to know well enough, am I... Am I choosing this relationship to model my relationships after because it's familiar or because I've chosen in and of myself now that it's healthy and that I desire to have that healthy, those healthy boundaries, that healthy relationship, those healthy conversations, and it's something different than what you know or it's not familiar, you know, from your childhood. 
right. it's really, really important to know the difference and sort of be able to gauge that in yourself and trust yourself. You got trusting yourself is a really difficult thing, but we we tell you every week like trusting yourself is really important. You know, you, only you know what's best for you and your recovery. And yep, you're the expert. Yeah. Gosh, Bobby, I know we ran long, but we had to. We had to run long. This is this, this is very this comprehensive. Is, it is. It is. And like like we said, and I know we've gotten multiple tweets. We need to pick some of this apart and do yeah. individual um, Google Hangouts on some of these. And and you know we've had people say that. Wow, this is so much. Um, and again, not our intention to overwhelm you, but. Um, maybe this is not a bad approach is to take a topic and give you a broad overview and then we can start to break it down um, into little pieces so where it's more consumable and less overwhelming. Um, yeah. Bobby, we could maybe do um, we could do an entire course on healthy romantic relationships and these could be like the different um, yes. subtopics. I mean it we'll, we, we'll, Excellent we'll wait idea. to hear from you guys. We'll wait to hear from you guys. If you want us to do like an online course that has videos like this that you would go through in modules and sort of have like different little worksheets or questions or whatever and that's something that you would love um, on the topic of healthy romantic relationships since everyone really probably desires to have a healthy romantic relationship as you're choosing to be in a romantic relationship. So, um, But definitely we have our contact information that we're going to pop up on the screen and we're going to make sure we read it to you. Um, in case you're tuning in on a podcast platform and you're not viewing this on Roku or YouTube. Um, but we would love to hear from you. Let us know if this is a top. This seems like a topic that is very much a hot topic that people need more, more, uh, more information on. Comprehensive, uh, like an hour each or 30 to 45 minutes on each bullet point. So um, right. I know Bobby has our, our information. Yes. Um, we want to hear from you. We want to know what it is. And, you know, in the last several months, every topic that we've presented on has been one that you have asked us for. Um, we do put in ones that we um, think might be really timely and are something that we think um, would be helpful for everyone. But truly, when you tell us, I want to hear about this, that's what we talk about. We have enormous respect for that. Um, if you want to reach out to us, please do on Twitter. I am Truth is Hers. Um, Athena is Athena Moberg. And then you can also tweet us at Trauma Recovery U. You can reach out to us on email at Bobby L. Parrish at gmail.com or Athena at Athena Moberg.com. Um, we have our websites, bobbyparish.com, athenamoberg.com, traumarecoveryuniversity.com. And then on Facebook, um, we have Trauma Recovery University has a page, and then Athena Moberg fan page. She has um, a page. I have a page, Bobby Parrish Coaching and Consulting. And then oh, each I of us. Need to add that. I need to add that to our list, new. Bobby. It's new, new, new. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited today to see that I'm almost up to 100 likes. Yay! Yay! Um, and then we have our personal pages, and you're more than welcome to friend us. Uh, we want to connect with you. Um, and mine is Bobby Parrish, and Athena is at Dawn Athena Moberg. So we want to hear from you. Please contact us. Sometimes, sometimes, it can be a little bit before we're able to get back to you. Uh, please forgive us. Um, we do have a lot on our plates, but we do want to hear from you. We got um, we got some comments on our um, YouTube channel, uh, people thanking us for their videos and so forth. And I haven't responded to everybody's comments yet, and um, we have some um, reviews on Roku, and I haven't responded to all those. And I don't even so know we how really, to. I have, we we just we appreciate your patience because we're just a we're just a two man show here. And then yep. we have Harriet. Harriet's our assistant, and she does all of our transcribing, and she's behind the scenes. And then we have this other gal that's helping with Facebook, and it's we're growing, but we have growing yes. teams as we're yes. growing. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's look at the ways that you can interact with us in terms of Twitter chats, um, this Google Hangout, Roku TV. Again, Monday is our um, chat that was originally intended to um, work for the time frame of our UK contingent. And you know, we actually had someone from Holland 
there this morning. Did you see that, Athena? I did. I saw yes. that. And there was someone that was um, from Australia as well, born oh, and raised okay. Australia, now okay. living in the UK. Okay. Um, and that is the hashtag CSAQT, Child Sexual Abuse Question Time. It's at 10 a.m. Pacific for U.S. and 6 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time for the U.K. audience. And then Tuesday is our other Twitter chat, and that is the hashtag sex abuse chat. It's at 6 p.m. PST, um, 9 Eastern in the U.S., and that is 2 a.m. on Wednesday morning for the U.K. audience. And then here, if you're with us now, you're um, and live, you are with our Google Hangout. Um, that can always be watched at any time on Roku TV or on our YouTube channel. But to be with us live, that's Monday nights at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 Eastern, or in the UK, it's Tuesday morning at 2 o'clock. So, and if you would like to join one of our private secret Facebook groups for survivors of sexual abuse, please reach out to us. We have multiple groups that we can put you into um, so that you can get support and access to other survivors 24-7. Yeah. Yay. Yay. We are so grateful for you guys. I know we ran long today, um, but it is so worth it because we know that um, this information is information that you have asked for. So... We're grateful to be able to get it to you, even if it did mean we ran a little bit over. And um, we'll be waiting to hear from you to find out if, um, like we were saying, Bobby, if maybe we should do like an online course or something with multiple modules. Perhaps right. on like Kajabi or something, we could do that on Kajabi. Right. That would be. I think that would be an excellent idea. Um, let us know what you think and whether Ooh. it's something that you want. I know what we forgot to to mention. Huh. We have our Indiegogo campaign that's going to be launching soon. Yes, we're going to do a crowdfunding campaign. So um, please look forward to details. It should be out in the next day or two. Uh, we're looking to put together um, some funding for regular weekend conferences in the United States um, in order for us to meet with people one-on-one, -on -one, provide education and community, and also to develop a password protected website for survivors so that they can engage in support in a community in a protected environment. We've had a lot of people um, who don't feel comfortable speaking out in the Twitter chats. They just want to lurk because it's too public for them or um, they don't want to be in one of the Facebook groups because um, they aren't on Facebook anymore given uh, privacy concerns. So we're and looking family, to family yeah. issues. Family yeah. issues. So we're looking to build a whole separate website that's password protected that yeah. gives survivors a venue um, to get support. And then we want to come out. We want to meet with you. We want to do conferences, um, weekend seminars in different cities. And so look for that um, Indiegogo crowdfunding um, campaign to be coming out in the next couple days. It's now March 2nd. It should be up and going by the 4th or 5th. Yeah. Well, we're so grateful uh, for your guys' time, and oh, I'm starting to hear a little bit of an echo on my end, Bobby. I'm, I'm assuming uh -oh. that means we're done. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we appreciate you guys every single week. Thank you for following along with us. Thank you for being on this journey with Bobby and I for all these several months or year or whatever it's been since you've been with us. So yes. um, it's our privilege to come to you every single week and to reach out to our local communities and and abroad into other countries, Holland, um, our people in the UK, um, the people that were um, from Australia and New Zealand and I mean we just we have a lot of different countries that are that are starting to come along and join us. So it's a privilege for us to be able to be here with you and um, we look forward to seeing you every single week. Please reach out to us and um, interact with us, send us a message, let us know what you want us to teach on or talk about. Thanks, guys. Yes. Good night. Good night, everybody. <laughs>